This is a very personal view of, of Lyme disease. I sort of see it in three eras. 1976 to 19 er, uh, 1990 was a time of great openness and discovery and trying to figure out what Lyme disease really is, what the many, many manifestations are, what the proper diagnostic tests were, or some beginning preliminaries on diagnostic tests, and certainly describing the full many, many different manifestations of Lyme disease. So if you look at that early literature, it's quite informative and fascinating. And then in uh, 1990 to 2008, I saw as a period of narrow definitions and retrenchment. And that was done for good reasons. It was done because the cent uh, Centers for Disease Control wanted to create really good surveillance criteria that could monitor the spread of disease over time. And in order to do that, you needed objective clinical criteria and you needed a good diagnostic tests. So things became narrowed down. One of the mistakes that was made, I think, during that time was the clinicians started to use the surveillance criteria as their only criteria for diagnostic determination. That's not what the Centers for Disease Control was recommending, but that's what some uh, individuals did. And then 2008 to the present, I see it as a time of renewed discovery and exploration. And that's because of the great advances in biotechnology. That's because of a number of studies that have come out. And it's a time of great hope. So for patients here, I think you should be encouraged and happy about what you're going to be seeing in the next few years, because it will make a huge difference for you. So Willie Bergdorfer is this charming, happy guy who uh, was the Swiss tick surgeon in 1982 to, who discovered that it wasn't a virus after all inside ticks that was causing the disease, but rather it was a spirochete. And the spirochete was named after him. The treatments had evolved into antibiotics, but initially they thought it was anti-inflammatories. Uh, and it really helped to en enhance the recognition that what we have in the United States is, is pretty much the same with, with important differences to what was going on in Europe. Alan Steer was the individual who was a young epidemiology researcher in rheumatology at Yale who um, identified and described the first cases of Lyme arthritis among children and associated it with the rash. He also has, over the years, researched the role of autoimmunity, identified genetic risk, identified an autoantigen. And he also, importantly, reported in the New England Journal of Medicine that not all cases meet the CDC surveillance criteria. So one out of five cases would be missed if you strictly apply the CD surveillance criteria. He also reported that antibiotics may not always lead to a cure, and that's been a lot of his work on Lyme arthritis. But he also reported a, a small number of cases of children who had visual problems associated with Lyme disease. One, one poor child who became blind as a result of the increased intracranial pressure. And my interest as a psychiatrist and a neuropsychiatrist is on brain imaging. And he was one of the first to report brain blood flow deficits in Lyme. So he's done a lot of interesting and important work. And I also want to recognize my colleague, Dr. Datweiler here, who is one of the early pioneers as well, who did some of the original pivotal studies on the treatment of early Lyme disease in the 1980s. So we, here on the upper left, you see a cluster of unexplained childhood arthritis. It was Polly Murray. Mothers have had a huge influence in shaping the study of this disease, and she was the one who brought it to the attention of the public health authorities. Then the spirochete was found in the tick in 1981-82. Then a paper came out called Lyme disease, the new great imitator. And why was it called that? Because syphilis, syphilis was described as the, new, uh, as the great imitator because it had so many different manifestations. Andy Packner wrote this paper. He was a neurologist. And he was very impressed with the fact that sometimes, not often, rarely, you can see cases that look like multiple sclerosis, or in one case in that paper, uh, childhood onset OCD after Lyme arthritis. And then the CDC adopted the two-tier criteria, which I'm, I know that Dr. Datweiler will be talking about. The genome was sequenced, and that was very important and very helpful. It later enabled them to look that the Iceman, who was 5,000 years old, actually had spirochetal DNA. And then in 1998, the vaccine came out, Limerix, a uh, very important uh, and big effort to create that vaccine. But the problem was it wasn't 100% protective for everybody who took it. It required lots of booster shots. And there was concern among patients that maybe it initiated some arthritic problems and neuropathic problems. So the popularity of it declined. And as a result, people stopped taking it. SmithKline took it off the market.
And then there were their Lyme clinical trials, which I'll be talking about shortly. And then in 2008, an article was uh, published out of Steve Bartol lab at, in UC Davis, where he documented the persistence of the Borrelia spirochete after antibiotic treatment. He's a preeminent researcher, a member of the Institute of Medicine, and when he writes something, people pay attention. And it actually had been written by Dr. Straubinger in an earlier report among beagles in, in, in uh, 2000, I think it was, 1999. But that was largely ignored because he was a postdoc writing a paper and he wasn't uh, as recognized. But what was important about that is that suddenly it opened up the thought processes that maybe it is true that some patients out there do have persistent infection. If it's occurring in the animals, perhaps it could also be occurring in the human. So as a result, research opened up. And as a result, people like Dr. Zhang and people like Dr. Lewis are studying per sister Borrelia. And then the CDC came out and reported that there were 300,000 new cases of Lyme disease each year, which was an increase from the 30,000. And that was really important because it led a lot of diagnostic pioneers to put more efforts into developing new diagnostic tests because by doing so, they might develop the next great diagnostic test, which would be great for the public health and also great financially. So it was a good, it was a good thing for everybody. It allows people to get grants and uh, recognizes the severity and importance of the disease. And then, as we all know, systems biology and the omics revolution has been hugely important. It has allowed us to study things that, in ways that we weren't able to do before. And if you collect samples very carefully over time and longitudinally, you can see what's different in those patients who have persistent Lyme symptoms versus those patients who recovered. And you can look at the DNA and the RNA and the proteins and the metabolome. And by doing so, perhaps we'll be able to develop better tests and perhaps we'll be able to understand the pathophysiology and devise better treatments. So that's super exciting. So it's really a great time in the research opportunities for Lyme disease and for patients. So now in my next seven minutes, I'm going to review all the clinical trials in the U.S. that we've done on Lyme disease, as well as talk about one trial that was recently published in the Netherlands. So in the U.S., there were two symptom-specific studies, one from Columbia, one from Stony Brook. The one from Columbia looked at Lyme encephalopathy. That's one that we did. The one from Stony Brook focused on post-Lyme fatigue. And then there were two heterogeneous symptom studies that were uh, the same study design, but there was a group of seropositive and a seronegative patients out of the New England Medical Center. And then there was the, also a heterogeneous symptom study in the Netherlands. And the reason why I'm focusing on what's homogeneous and what's heterogeneous is because it's super important. If you're designing a clinical trial and you're including people in the study who have a heterogeneous group of symptoms, you may not be able to show a treatment effect, whereas if you focus on a particular problem, enroll people based on the severity of that particular problem, you're more likely to see a treatment effect. So I'll quickly go through our study at Columbia, since I know it the best. And uh, our goal was to assess brain structure and function and to assess improvement in response to 10 weeks of IV ceftriaxone versus placebo. These patients met highly conservative criteria for post-treatment Lyme syndrome, so the creme of the creme of, of rigorous diagnostics for these patients. They were treated for 10 weeks, and then uh, their primary outcome was at 12 weeks, and we looked to see if they sustained their response without antibiotics to the 24-week endpoint. It was a small sample size, unfortunately, because our criteria were so rigid and so conservative. It was enormously hard to find patients who met these rigid criteria. 23 got randomized to IV ceftriaxone, 14 to placebo, and we also had 18 healthy controls. We didn't give them antibiotics, of course, but the reason we had them was to monitor neurocognitive change over time, because if you give the same test over time, there'll be a practice effect and people will get better. So one, the main point is that my study included people who were particularly chronic. They had a mean amount of prior IV of two months and a mean amount of prior oral of seven months. Obviously, if we had enrolled patients who had much less antibiotic treatment, they'd be more likely to respond to treatment than if they had as much as these patients had. On, on initial finding in this study, they only had mild cognitive deficits, they had mild psychiatric issues, but they had very significant pain, fatigue, and physical disability. And I'm going to quickly pass through this. And this is the main outcome, where you see the lime green arrow is 
pointing out the drug group in black and the spotted line is the placebo group. You see the drug group making an improvement to a greater extent than the placebo group, but it did just went slightly above the range of statistical significance, 0.053, and then they lost all their gains when it came to the next three months. So in terms of conclusions, I couldn't, I had to say that 10 weeks of IV antibiotics does not lead to sustained benefit, because it didn't, so there was no difference between the drug and the placebo group for sustained benefit. However, if you look at the secondary, uh, secondary outcomes, which were fatigue, pain, and physical functioning, what you see at the uh, arrow there and under fatigue is a wide uh, difference between the placebo group and the drug group. The drug group dropped to a greater extent than the placebo group. If you looked at the bottom two lines, there's no difference between drug and placebo. And why is that? It's because they started without much fatigue. In the next, you see a wide difference in the drug and the placebo group among people who had high levels of pain, but no difference between people who had low levels of pain. And the same was true for physical functioning. So if you're more severe when you enter the study on the outcome of interest, you're going to possibly see a treatment effect. Were there objective biomarkers that differentiated the Lyme patients from the controls? Uh, we looked at global cerebral blood flow, and there was a difference. Uh, the patients had more difficulty vasodilating in response to a vasodilatory challenge, so there was some compromise of their vascular flow, and they had areas of decreased metabolism, primarily in their temporal and their parietal cortex, compared to age and uh, sex-matched controls. We could not find any blood markers that were associated with response to treatment, including the NKCD57, including inflammatory markers, including the IgM Western blot, including uh, titers for other infections. We did find, as I mentioned, that those who were worse clinically did better uh, with, with treatment. So the strengths and limitations of the study, uh, rigorously defined patients, excellent study retention, the weakness was a small sample size. It was severely underpowered to show any treatment differences. Would a less treatment refractory sample have done better? What alter alternative and safer non-antibiotic therapies may enhance patient response? What was the mechanism? Was it antimicrobial? Was it glutamate modulatory? Was it anti-inflammatory? We know that ceftriaxone does modulate glutamate. So my recommendation is that clinical research trials should focus on more homogeneous populations recruited for severity level. So I'll just briefly go through a couple of other trials. This was a wonderful study. I really liked this study out of Stony Brook because they recruited primarily for fatigue. Everybody had to meet a certain cutoff for fatigue to enter the study. Uh, they had three outcome measures, fatigue, reaction time, which is a cognitive test, and OSPE in the spinal fluid. But on only one, fatigue, were the patients uniformly impaired. They got one month of IV ceftriaxone, and then they were followed six months later to see what happened off of antibiotics. And lo and behold, the ceftriaxone group, 64% of them responded versus 18% of those on placebo. That was a significant difference. There was no improvement in cognition uh, that was different between the two groups, but they only had mild deficits to start with. There was no change in OSPE, but only nine of the 55 patients had OSPE, so that was a meaningless outcome measure. So there you see that there was even a biomarker of treatment response, which was whether or not you were IgG Western blot positive at the time of study entry. Of those who were enrolled, 80% benefited from the treatment compared to 13% on placebo. And then when I was uh, writing my manuscript for the journal Neurology, the reviewers asked me, please analyze your data using the exact same enrollment criteria that the Krupp Stony Brook study used and see what you come up with and analyze it the same way. And as you can see from the left and the right, left is the Krupp study, right is my study, the results were identical in terms of improvement in fatigue. So when you have a second study done by a different group that corroborates the first study, it gives greater credibility, of course, to the findings from the first study. Now, I want to recognize the Infectious Disease Society of America does not agree with the way I've just presented this data. Antibiotic therapy, they say, has no proven uh, benefit for PTLDS, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. 
The British Infection Association says studies of prolonged antimicrobial treatment have not shown sustained benefit. The European Federation of Neurological Society says American trials have demonstrated that additional prolonged antibiotic treatment is ineffective in post-Lyme disease syndrome. So I'm raising this as a point of discussion for later. But if you look at these studies, I don't see why that's so difficult to see, that there's an improvement associated with repeated antibiotic therapy. This is not extended. This is repeated antibiotic therapy. And the effect size, which is important in clinical trials to say, is this meaningful, was moderate to large. And I can tell you, for drug studies of fibromyalgia and the drugs that are FDA approved in the United States, the effect size is mild in size. So these were moderate to large effect sizes. Now, there was a very significant study, the Klempner study, which was the largest study in the US, which was negative. It was a study of seronegative and seropositive patients. They used uh, a, a measure of functional impairment, but they did not recruit based on a certain cutoff of functional impairment. It was, it was a carefully done study. They were hoping to show benefit with 30 days of IV ceftriaxone and 60 days of oral doxy compared to placebo, but there was no difference in the primary outcome of um, physical and mental functioning. And there was no difference in change for cognition or depression. So the strength of that study compared to the other studies was that it was really a large sample size. The limitation was the heterogeneity of the patient sample. This is the Netherlands study, which was just published in April. And this was a randomized trial of longer term therapy for symptoms attributed to Lyme disease. Huge study, you have to give them credit, 280 patients. Only one third had objective clinical markers of past Lyme disease. So that was unusual. I don't think that would ever get funded by the National Institute of Health. Two thirds had possible past Lyme disease uh, with nonspecific symptoms with a positive IgM or IgG Western blot. So because they included a very heterogeneous group, we don't know how many of those patients truly had past Lyme disease or didn't because you can have false positive IgM Western blots. And oddly, 11% of the people in this trial had never before been treated for Lyme disease. So it was a truly mixed, confusing group. Okay, two minutes, I'm pretty much done. Uh, so they gave oral, they gave, everybody got 12 weeks of IV ceftriaxone followed by oral placebo, oral doxy, or, or oral clarithro and hydroxychloroquine. Because there was no placebo during the first two weeks, this study cannot state whether or not repeated antibiotic therapy was helpful. And there was no benefit seen for extended antibiotic therapy beyond the first two weeks. But again, the heterogeneity of the sample makes it very hard to know what to conclude from this study. So I want to highlight the difference between efficacy versus clinically recommended. Krupp's study showed efficacy, but she concluded it wasn't clinically recommended. Why? Because of side effects associated with IV antibiotics. That doesn't mean it didn't work. It just meant that we need a safer treatment. So the conclusion, guideline committees should include a statement indicating that retreatment with IV ceftriaxone has been shown to reduce fatigue and post-treatment Lyme syndrome in two U.S. trials. Treatment with fewer side effects are needed. Other treatments also are needed for those who are no longer benefiting from antibiotics, and there are many patients who have ongoing symptoms despite quite, quite a good course of treatment with antibiotics. Thank you for your attention.